So Baruch Hashem, we are a week close to the Purim. As you understand, it's really getting there. All of us aren't going to like this. It's also a week closer to Pesach. Um, a lot of people uh, have been asking me this week if I ever found my notebook. I know why people were so... Uh... Now, let me tell you what the problem is. The problem is that all over Tarvadas I have notebooks laying. Because I usually take out... You know what the problem is? If one notebook would cost like $7, I would keep it the entire week. It would take me at least a week to lose it. But you go to these sales in like Walmart and Staples at the beginning of the week, and you buy like 56 notebooks for two, for two cents, and then as a result, you use up all 56 in one day. That's what I learned. That's what happens. So I pull out a notebook, and I usually take it to Yeshiva, and I always make up, I'm going to leave it in the same place. So I know where it is. The problem is I keep leaving it, I keep making up different places. So there's notebooks on the steam, there's notebooks on the hanger, there's notebooks in the Svarim Shank. So the, the, the real problem is that when I say, can I, anyone find my notebook, I have like 30 people coming to me with notebooks that they found throughout town. So I decided that I'm going to play it safe this week, and I'm going to go back to good old index cards. Yes. No, not iPads, index cards. This is what they, this, this is what used to be the Palm Pilot uh, of, of uh, Palm Pilot. This was the smartphone. These are very smart. These, they, you know, it's, uh, it's 10 gig. It doesn't, uh, battery never uses out. Can you imagine? It works on solar energy, this. Okay. So I said, if I index cards, you see, unlike a notebook, which you can put on the seat of your car, and then it rolls into the pocket, and you empty out the entire car and do badikas chametz to find it. Uh, index cards you put into your pocket. So I said, now I will not have a problem. So I came here, and I took them out of my pocket. There is only one problem. I had one stack where I wrote down the shear, and the other stack was the empty cards that I was taking from. Guess which stack I brought. So I said, never say you don't need the Rabbi Nishleim, that there's no problem. But then Baruch Hashem, I looked on the other side, and I said, shoo, that was a close one. Okay, so we begin, Parshas Yisroi, and uh, let's start with this. I mean, they developed the Tzayot Hazam Naisa. They say there was such a story that there was somebody who was charged with armed robbery, and he pleaded not guilty. He said it's a, a case of mistaken identity. Those cameras don't know what they're talking about. It wasn't me, it wasn't me, and he hired a very good lawyer. And uh, it went on for a while. And then, Baruch Hashem, the court found him not guilty. The court found him not guilty of armed robbery. And he was, his lawyer said to him, did you hear? You were found not guilty of armed robbery. And he jumps up and he goes, does that mean I can keep the money, he says? <laughs> right? <laughs> the um, <laughs> story goes that somebody came and he stayed over by a kretschman, a chsanya tavern overnight. He didn't look didn't like the looks of the tavern owner. The guy looked a stickle uh, suspicious. So he didn't trust to keep the money in a drawer. Instead, he went out to the backyard and he dug a hole and, and he hid the money in a very, very, he thought was a very good place behind the tree. Came down pretty deep, covered it with earth. And uh, the next morning, the guy was following him out and following him around. So he said, look, I'm going to have to leave now. I'll come back in a day or two when he's not looking, climb into the backyard and retrieve my 500 ruble that I hid there. So after a couple of days, he comes back and he starts digging. No, the money is not there. So the guy obviously saw him and uh, he took the money for himself. He says, now what? You know, he can't even charge him. What? But he took money that was buried in his backyard. So he ran to the rub and began to cry and said, well, what, 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 what could I do? So the rub gave him an idea. He went back to the man and he knocked on the door, he said, you know, I stayed here once, it was such a nice day, do you mind if I stay again? He says, absolutely no problem. Mm -hmm. And he says to him, can I, can I talk to you? Can I ask you something? He says, yeah. He says, last time, I hid 500 in your backyard. He goes, really? <laughs> yeah. And you know, I realize it's such a good place, I was so secure, I'd like to hide another thousand there. Uh, do you mind? I know last time I didn't ask your permission, but tonight, can I put another thousand, leave it for a few weeks? The guy goes, of course. So, of course, he runs to put back the first 500, because he doesn't want 
that when he is going to dig it up and see the money's missing, right? He wants him to put the thousand, so he gets the full uh, fifteen hundred. <laughs> right? So he comes back that night. He opens it up. The money's there, and he takes it and he yells, "Oh, by the way, I changed my mind," he said, and he takes the five hundred and uh, he goes with it. Mm-hmm. Now, I kid you not. Somebody told me this story. He was an administrator of a very big yeshiva. He said he always went to a donor who always gave him a check, and the check always bounced. But he found out that like, the guy would give him a $20,000 check, he had $19,000 in the account. If he gave him a $25,000 check, he had 24000 in the account. So he took a chance once. The guy gave him a $25,000 check. He went and he deposited $1,000 into the person's account, waited a day or two, and then he cashed the check. And mind you, the one who wrote the check was not a very happy camper. Yeah. He said, I'm going to call the police and tell them what? That uh, I deposited your check that you signed to me? Mm-hmm. So sometimes a step in the wrong direction is a step in the right direction. There's a famous story that said there was a guy that went around, he wanted to borrow, he walks up to somebody, he says, I want to borrow $10,000. You want to borrow $10,000? I don't know you. He says, look what I have. He takes out a diamond. And he says, just to go, the guy assesses the diamond, it's a $10,000 diamond. What's your problem? Keep it as collateral. He goes, okay. He says, let me just polish it a little bit, I'll be right back. Of course, he runs to polish it and changes it with a diamond that he got in his Cracker Jack box and uh, gives it to him. And after a while, he's calling him to come, uh, you know, I want my money, I want my money. He says, what's your problem? You have the diamond, you have the diamond. So somehow he has a feeling that this diamond that this doesn't have the same uh, shine as the first one does, and he takes it to an assessor who assesses it for a $25 charge, and he tells him, I hate to tell you, but uh, the 25 that far exceeds the value of this uh, diamond. So again, he runs to the Rav, perhaps even the same Rav, he says, Rebbe, what do I do? He says, I have an idea. Mm. He says, a Shmua goes out, he walks into Shul the next morning, and he goes, I there! tragedy. I lost the diamond. Someone gave me a $10,000 diamond of a collateral and I lost it. I lost it. This guy hears it. Uh, he takes $10,000 cash. Comes and says, okay, listen, I'm ready to pay you. Uh, where's the diamond? You know, he figures hey, so he can get his name cleared. He goes, where's the diamond? I'm ready to pay you. Here it is. Here's the $10,000. The guy goes, here's the diamond. He goes, why? <laughs> yeah, but at that point, it was like uh, too late. Okay. So we know there are some people that are less than honest. I remember uh, somebody told me that he overheard this conversation. I am not going to say where, okay, but he overheard a conversation where uh, kids came to collect their regent marks. And the teacher was saying, for some reason you all did very well on the multiple choice part. Yeah, I wonder why. Okay. Um, The fact that we sometimes get into ruts and we think the world is over, and we dive in, Hashem, help me! Instead of a Kaddish Baruch Hu helping us, we wound up, it seems like Kaddish Baruch Hu slapping us in the face again. And very often, the second problem is the solution to the first problem. And Reb Tzaddik writes about this a lot. He says, in life you will look back, and definitely after 120 years, they will show you that when a person was enduring multiple complications in his life, that usually they will show you in Shemayim, and sometimes we see it down here in this world, how the second problem is a solution to the first problem. Except we don't understand that. We think that we're asking Kaddish Baruch Hu for help, and instead of help, he's, he's pushing us down even more. Um, the uh, Svas Emes has a theme that he repeats throughout the Sedras, and he says that Basarim Amoris Nivra Oilam, Shem created the world with the ten... Ten mamorais, ten commands. There were ten makais, and there are, there are seres hadibrais, and all these three correspond to each other. Now let's try to explain this a little bit. We have discussed beforehand that there are two things that only one bari oilam, one creator of the world, can do, and that is to create a a yesh me'ayin, and number two, to create an ayin me'yesh. There is no one that all the sophisticated science in the world cannot create something out of nothing. We can take forms of matter and recreate it, and we can take scientific principles that exist since Sheshis and Meberashis and send rocket ships to the moon. But what we cannot do is create something out of nothing. 
For that matter, we cannot make an eye in Mayesh. No one can take anything and make it cease to exist. The World Trade Center exists in its entirety, albeit in a different form. It may exist in trillions and trillions of particles, almost impossible to count, maybe half as much as the budget deficit, but it exists. It may exist in different forms. It may have been reduced to, from solid to, to liquid to gas, but you can't take anything and make it non-existent. Because whatever exists in this world, HaKadosh Baruch Hu put into place by Sheshis May Bereshis. And kind of look at it this way. I heard from uh, Rav Miller from Gateshead that he came into his house once and his children were playing Monopoly. And he walked, and an hour later he walked out, they're still playing Monopoly. So they were a little embarrassed. They said, what should we do? We enjoy the game. So he told them, you know, life is a Monopoly game. He says, you know, but the when we finish, we just take all the pieces and we throw it into the box. He says, yeah, that's what life is. People own big hotels, you know, and when they're finished, uh, they take the person and they throw them into the box. The pieces in the Monopoly game are all there. HaKadosh Baruch Hu created it by Sheishis Yimei Bereishis. There are no new pieces. The only thing that changes is the layout. HaKadosh Baruch Hu throws it into the box, gives it out, and the layout changes again. But there is nothing new and nothing disappears. The same is true for the neshamais. When a baby is born, that is not a new neshama. The Medrash says clearly, every single neshama was created with the words, Bereshis bara elakim. There are no new neshamas. Just these neshamas keep going up and down, and we are given to deal with the circumstances of our time. Now, I want to take this a step further, as it is explained. There is only a certain amount of money on this world. I want to explain that. What do you mean money? Well, what type of currency? I mean, the Zimbabwean coin is, you know, like 10 trillion uh, things for... I don't mean the amount that is printed. The amount that is printed or coined or minted, here for all our economics people here, is only a representative value. What is money? Money is a hechetimsa that causes people to get out there and do what they have to do. If every single person in the world, right? I mean, uh, Hitler, Yimach had this plan. He actually had underground counterfeit operations. And a, 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 a Yid told me that he, his life was saved because he was put into one of these uh, things. They had to print American dollars. Because it was strange how they picked accountants. They picked people that would know what money looks like, as if... Uh, and uh, they were very, very well fed, because the understanding was, in order for them to have a clear, to be able to check it clearly. And his plan was to take millions and millions of dollars and dump it on the doorsteps of every American home somehow. And with that, he, it would totally crush the industry. And America would stop producing planes, and stop producing ships, and stop producing everything, because, hey, I have so much money, what do I have to go to work for? The problem is if everyone says that, you starve to death. So really the metzias of money is a way that forces people to get out and do what we have to do. If neither of us needed money, then we would not be happy people. There is study after study that is done that lottery winners are, don't have happy lives. That we've done this before. I'm not going to get into the whole lottery picture again, but that whole story. But the, the divorce rate goes up because the MS, money is a means that forces us to get out and to do things. Or it's power that gives us the power to force others to do things for us. But either way, so one of the things that the Federal Reserve does is, no worry, I'm not going to test you on this, one of the things that the Federal Reserve does is controls the money supply. You print too much money, the money loses value. You print too little, it's, it's meaningless. Either way, you ha it's, it's a science to know how much money you have to put out there so that it helps to stimulate the economy, meaning it forces people out there to work. But the Svar and Magdashim explain as follows. The bottom line is that out of the 6 billion people, whatever the world population is, we have to go to work. At least we are supposed to go to work. I was once standing in the Social Security office, goes back many, many years ago, and a man was standing there with his son-in-law, 
and he wanted to get a certain social security card approved. There was a certain kind of card, and the, the one behind the desk says, no, 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 I can't give you that card. Because uh, then he got, and the man says, why not? Because then your son-in-law is going to work, and he's not allowed to work yet. He didn't have his, whatever his immigration status was at that point. And this father-in-law says, I promise you, my, my son-in-law, you're accusing of working. He will never. Not a, not a shash. No way, he ain't working. No, no, you have nothing to worry about. He's not going to work a day in his life. There, there is a certain amount of effort that every human being in this world can contribute. The reality is that it's a puzzle. Many people do nothing, and others do much more than what they can do. But the reality is it's all out there. And the Rabbani Shalom creates a puzzle out of this. There's a year that once came to the Apterov, said, I have to marry off a daughter, what should I do? The Apterov took out a letter. He said, go to this and this Gavir, and tell him on, on the account that we have, he should give you 300 rubles. So he travels to this town, he sees this gorgeous house surrounded by fountains and all sorts of exotic birds and guards standing in front and the Rolls Royce of carriages and he walks up and pounds on the front door and the butler comes in, he says, I have a letter from the Apterov, he takes him in, sits down in his parlor and he gives him the letter and the man reads it, he goes, I don't know what your Rebbe is talking about. On account, 300 rubles? I have no cheshbon with your rabbi. I have no account with him. I don't know what he's talking about. I have nothing of the sort. He says, listen, my rabbi said, look at the brachas he's giving you. I have no account with your rabbi. He says, normally I give a half a ruble. I'm willing to give you a whole. But that's it. He was some of the big spenders. Mm. Know that story. I told you many times. There was this year who was unbelievably uh, cheap. His wife couldn't take it. She says, so many mitzvahs were losing out because you're so cheap. I want you to invite a guest. So he goes out and uh, he's willing to spend a quarter. That's it. Goes to the fish store. He says, can I have a serving of fish? How much? For a quarter. He says, for a quarter you can take the fish that's sitting outside in the, uh, you know, that was thrown out six days ago. So he takes it home and he brings home a guest. Says to his wife, see, we did a chnasas He says, you know, that guest is very sick now. He goes to visit him. She goes, that guest died. You know, he goes to the Leviah. She says, and what do you have to say for yourself? It says, what a beautiful world this is. For one quarter, you get to fulfill Achnosis Archim, Bikr Chaylim, Halva Sameis, like, it's amazing. All right, so this guy takes out a half a ruble, and he says, listen, uh, you have a letter from the Aptarav, I'll give you a whole ruble. That's it. So he comes back to the Aptarav, he says, okay, so go to so-and-so. So he goes to so-and-so, and this so-and-so doesn't have big exotic birds flying around in his garden. He has a very uh, nice, but a much more, obviously, a moderate house. And he shows him the letter. <coughs> the guy says, I'm going to get you a few hundred rubble. The, the rubble, the Rebbe said, I just don't have the money right now. And he searches and searches and searches and, and sells some of his stuff and pawns it and comes back with the 300. And Lamaisa, as time went on, things began to change. The big Gavir started having setback after setback in business. Here his ship sank. Here one of his factories went up in flames. And then the insurance company found some clause in the contract that they don't have to pay for it. And as time went on, it dwindled. And this other man became rich. So he understands that this is like a capet of the Apterov. So he comes running to him and he's like really, really upset. And he says, Reb, why did you curse me? And the Apterov said, Chasel Hasko, I never cursed you. He said, you told me I have a cheshben with you. What cheshben do I? I don't have no cheshben with you. He says, let me tell you, when I was about to be born on this world, it says before in the Shammah is sent down, so they're geyser whether he should be a tzaddik or a rasha. They try to decide what he should be, a tzaddik or a rasha. He said, and I was, uh, and, no, I'm sorry, they, they tell him everything. They tell him he's going to be rich or poor, tall, thin, you know, but athletic, not athletic, uh, everything they tell, which house he's going to live in, or, the only thing they don't do is, don't do is whether he's a tzaddik or a rasha. He says, me, they gave a lot of money. And I said, no, 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 I don't need this. No, this is only trouble. I don't need so much money. <laughs> they said, well, we gave it to you. What are you supposed to do with it? He says, I'll tell you what. He says, uh, I'll leave it up here. I said, you can't do that. I've got to take it down with you. Can't leave it up here. You're moving, I've got to take your money with you. He says, I don't want to come down to this world with money. They tell him, listen, there are certain things you have to do. And you're on a mitzvah, you can do with this money. He says, you know what? I'll let other people, other neshamas, take it down with me. Which the Shama wants to take it down? So a bunch of the Shama said, I'll, I'll take it. I'll, I'll, I'll come down with it. I don't mind being born with a silver spoon in my mouth. So uh, you, the after I said to him, you agreed to take part of the money. And we had an agreement. When I need it, I'll send for it. That's what I said, 300 on the Cheshbon. Mm-hmm. He says, you don't want it. So uh, they took the money away from you. They gave it to someone else. He said, I never cursed you. Chas Now, the idea is, 
that we have to think that when a mitzvah comes our way, we may not necessarily have a Baal Ruach HaKadosh who's letting us know, but HaKadosh Baruch Hu is telling us something. The uh, Apterov was very into revealing, uh, apparently had a special insight as to who he was before he came down to this world. He used to say, as a matter of fact, that he was a Kohen Gadol in the previous life, that's what he said. As a matter of fact, on Yom Kippur, he used to say, Kach Hayisi Oimer, this is what I used to say, before he would be Zorik the Dam. They say once there was a certain episode, a uh, quote, a uh, Choshava, end quote, uh, Yid, who came, the man was a Kayan, and he was very angry and upset, and the after of saw him, and he just started laughing. So afterwards he said, I hope the Rebbe doesn't mind my asking, but what exactly was so funny? He says, uh, you called yourself up Kayan, you know? He says, I am a Kayan, as I've told you many times. This MC calls somebody up, to, he says, now we're introducing Haraf Agon, you know, uh, my Shianko, a great Goen, a great Tzaddik, Hakoyen, to please address the island. He turns to the MC, he goes, in, not a Koyen, he goes, in, the Rabbit Tzaddik doesn't bother you, and the Goen, and only the Koyen bothers you. you know. Anyway, so the Apterov tells him, he says, listen, you were a Koyen in the previous Gilgal. I want to know why you were laughing. He says, come into the next room, I don't want to say it, Barabba. So they go into the next room. He says, you were a Koyen, you were like training in young Koyen. And uh, you lived up to your reputation of Kehanim, uh, Kapdonim Haim, and uh, you were giving them a very, very hard time. And if somebody came to you and said, I have to be Makar Vakarb Mechatas, and you would ask him, What do you do? And he would say, He's Aveira. You would go, What? You are Aveira? And Aveira, how dare you? The poor guy melted. And the Talmudim were very upset. Have Rahmanas the guy. He's coming for a chuva. He wants to bring a carbon. What are you doing to him? So, my Shahoya Kachoya, that. Uh, one day, this big tzaddik, this kayan, wakes up Friday night and he forgets that he lights the fire for the uh, coffee. You know? So uh, the next day, he tells one of the guys to get me, uh, get me an animal for a karmachatas. They wanted to say, aha, you can also make a mistake. And he wiped that smirk off your face. And he tells these two uh, talmidim, these two kayanim, he says, you better keep this between us. Okay? He says, so the two of them look at each other. They want to get the word out. So uh, all of a sudden they uh, accidentally or not so accidentally leave the pen open and uh, his uh, little lamb goes running away. And he goes, it's running, go get it. And they run out. Hey, it's the, it's the rabbi's chattas. Go get the rabbi's chattas. He's running away. It's running through town. It, it's the rabbi's chattas. Go get it. Hey, that's the chattas he needs for the Friday night. Go get it. You know, he goes, no, 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 no. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I'll never forget... Uh, Someone told me this story about uh, a certain uh, yeah, there was an Adam Gadol, and uh, he uh, in those days there, were, there was no Hamadia when I was growing up. You remember <laughs> there was two uh, Yiddish papers. You remember there was the Morgan Journal, and there was the uh, Farvitz. None of them were exactly uh, very uh, hashkafically inclined, but I guess that was his only way of knowing what was going on in the world. So he took the liberty of uh, so they're riding in the car, and he, this guy told me he's his driver. Right? He's sitting in the back. And they pull over by a newsstand, and he says, oh, get me the Titan, you know, give me the paper. So he walks out, you know, and he goes, and he turns around, and he goes, he's like screaming to the open door. And a bunch of people are walking up, and then he goes, hey, the Rosh Yeshiva wants the Morgan Janal or the Farvards? And he goes, get it back into the car. <laughs> okay. Um, so, you know, he's telling, he's, as he said, I saw you, I started laughing, I started thinking of that story. They're running after the uh, Karben Chattas. It was like, uh, as Nancy Sroll once, the first time I was there, you know, they asked you in the airport, did you have, did you watch your suitcase the entire time? So I was like, you know, the first time I was there, sickle naive, I go, well, maybe in the hotel there were like two minutes that I didn't see it, and they go, ah. Oh. And I realized they opened it up. Let me explain something to you. On the way going, my wife packed my suitcase, so everything was organized perfect. On the way back, I packed my suitcase, okay? So basically, I threw all my clothes in, and I had three of my Talmudim jump on it until it was lowered down. We were able to click it, and I said, you don't want to open that suitcase, because no, you're checking for bombs. <laughs> it is a bomb, you know? I was sure enough to open it up, boom, and, you know, my clothes are all over the room. I'm like, Anyway, Baruch Hashem, they found no bombs there. And uh, everyone's, like, helping me put it back, and I'm a little late for my flight, and I'm running, and then as I'm running... This, like, uniformed officer comes running after. He goes, Slicha Adoni, is that Shalacha? He's holding out his undershirt. And I go, keep it, all right? You know, like the whole airport's turning around, staring at me. Okay, you know, that's enough.
<laughs> so, we all come down with money, or we all come down in connection to people that have money, and the Rabbani Shleilam has this all cheshbind out, exactly how it works. Even the Masil Sisharim writes toward the end in the Shara Kedusha that the chayfetz of a person who reached the level of Kedusha has a special madrega. It's interesting, Rav Shmuel of Slanum, I think today's his yard or yesterday, the Divrei Shmuel, he had a tabak pushka, a pushka where he kept his snuff, from Rabbi Ram Mekalisk, who was one of the Talmidei HaBal Shem Tov. And he was very precious to him, and one day it disappeared. And then they just they looked for it, they made Padikas Chama, they didn't find it, they'll find it before Pesach, it was never found. One of the Rebbe's Chassidim was in Eretz Yisrael, and he's by a certain Chassid, and all of a sudden he sees a very familiar looking pushka there. Where did you get this? You found it. You know, somebody once said, Loisik Noivu was Taich, don't find things. Anyway, he guy admitted that he stole it. Uh, so he brought it back to the Rebbe. Now, the Rebbe wouldn't, wouldn't, didn't want it next to him afterwards. So they asked him, why not? So he said, because every time I'm going to see it, I'm going to think that a Yid sinned. It's not, I don't want such a thing next to me. So you realize how complicated it is. When we don't do what we're supposed to do, and we take what's not ours, how things, and, and somehow that has to be corrected. Every penny that a person takes that's not his has to be corrected. Every penny that was given to us for a purpose, and we don't use it for the right purpose, has to be corrected. So in last week's Sedra, they weren't taken Derek Heretz Polishtim, they took the roundabout route through Sinai. Why not? Because, you know, the Polishtim will come out to war, the Yidim will get scared, they'll turn around and run back to Mitzrayim. So Rav Moshe asks, so Hashem could have made that the Polishtim don't attack. So he says, that's not so posh. It is, that means that Hashem doesn't mix into Pechira and Yidiyah. It's their free choice. Good, so Hashem could have made that the Polishtim should attack and the Yidim should wipe them off the face of the earth. Lena Smalu Sasayim, who says they were deserving of that punishment. So Hashem could have made that the Polishim should attack and the Yidin shouldn't be hurt. They shouldn't be scared. Again, scare, whether they're scared or not, is totally in prayer, totally in their medreg of the tachim. So we see how complicated things are and how every single person's money and every single person's talents, whoever you are, interrelates with the people around you. And if we do what we're supposed to do, then that Indian reaches its shlamus. If we don't do what we're supposed to do, we may have to come back down to this world, the Kaddish Baruch has to turn the whole puzzle of the world to make sure that that item reaches its purpose of creation. In the Svarim Magdashim, it's explained that before the Chet Eitz Hadas, everything that a Kaddish Baruch Hu created was in place. After the Chet Eitz Hadas, there was something called Shviras Kalim. Imagine you're holding a huge big crystal dish, and it cracks into a thousand pieces and rolls down the stairs, and you have to go pick it up. And that's our avoida. And in a sense, that was done through Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim. By Kabbalah Satar, everything was back in place. By the Chet Egel, it replaced. And we're again wandering around the world, collecting all the pieces, until Mashiach comes. It's brought down, the shame the Mekubalim, that all of the Neshamites, when we leave this world, we are taken through the Ma'ara Samach And we come to Adam Harishan. And Adam Harishan asks us, listen, by, my, by the Eitz Hadas, everything broke up, or broke up. And the job of every single Neshama was to pick up some of those pieces by doing what he was supposed to do in life. Did you do your share? And we are embarrassed of Adam Harishain if we didn't do what we were supposed to do with our life. As a matter of fact, the Tferes Shloyma explains, the Mishnah says in Perki Avis, Ezu derech yishara adam. What's the proper path that a person should take for himself? So it says, Koshu Tferes Right, what's the Lashen? Kalshu Teferes Mina Adam. Le Adam Mina Adam. In other words, it has to be Teferes to Adam Arishan. Is Adam Arishan going to be satisfied? Yes. You did what you were supposed to do down here in this world. Yet say Adam, Le Fa'ali, Le Vadasay Adi Arab, we're going to be asked. I'm going to trouble you for water. Okay, I would ask Uncle Yankel, but he's not here. So, Yet say Adam, Le Fa'ali, Le Vadasay Adi Arab that we, Adam is Adam Arishan. Every person toward the end of his life is going to be asked, did you, did you do your share collecting all the pieces that broke by Adam Arishan? David HaMelech said, says the Tverish Shloyma, Hashem li loy ira mayasuli Adam. I don't have to be scared of Adam Arishan because I am Adam Arishan because Adam Arishan gave away 70 years of his life for David HaMelech. Let's try to put this in more practical terms. We know that there is a halacha that if someone is standing Shemona Esrei, 
you are not supposed to walk in front of him. Thank you very much. We know that there is a halacha that if someone is standing Shmon Esrei, you are not supposed to walk in front of him, lest you stare or disturb his tefillahs. You know the famous story, where Moshe was walking out, there was a little boy davening, he just stopped short. I had a kid that had no right to daven by the door, and the, the, the Gabon was saying, well, pick the kid up and move him over, you know, what's the problem? And Ramesha said, there's a wall here. How could I walk through the wall? What do you mean I'm late? If I'm late, can you walk through a wall? The halacha says I can't walk through. So let me, this scenario, okay? I'm in a shul, it goes back many years ago, this story. And there's this guy, like a davening near the wall. He's davening in a maybe a precarious kind of a place. And uh, it, it, he shouldn't have been there, like near the door, a little seichel. But that's where he's davening Shemines, right? And this guy's running through, and I'm... He looks at me, I said, I'm not supposed to walk with someone davening Shmon Esrei. But he's like, he looks at his watch, he's in a real rush. So he has an idea. What he's going to do, he's going to kvetch behind him. Okay? There was about a quarter inch uh, between him and the behind him. And this guy was, uh, shall we say, his circumference far exceeded a quarter inch. So he winds up like shoving himself through. The guy's like, you know, boom. And finally he gives like a that boom. The whole guy goes flying forward <laughs> onto the floor. He goes, what did you do? Well, you know, I walk in front of him, so you shouldn't stare at him. So he walked behind him, you know what I mean? He didn't walk behind him, he squeezed himself through behind him. Right. I, I, I think if you, the point is that the Rabbi Hashem says there are times in our life that we have to stop. Okay? And it wants to the beautiful vart. When you stop, because you don't want to stare somebody else's shmones, right? So you connect to his shmones. Whatever his tefillahs are accomplishing for himself applies to you also. Because you become an accomplice, so to speak. You become a messiah to him. And sometimes, because my shmones didn't do the trick, or I may have not had the schusim, but the fact that I'm stopping for someone else, that within itself is the greatest schus. Because that schus can't be taken away from you. What you do for the covet of the shmones can't be taken away from you. He's always said this story. Uh, you know, I went someplace, came into Davin, and we were in the snowstorms, and the man looks at me and says, you don't Davin with your rubbers on. Now, okay. I said, it's not so easy for me to take off my rubbers when my age, you know what I mean? I said, I could take them off. But the last time I did it, I came off with my shoe and my sock, and that was almost as embarrassing <laughs> as in the airport. Yeah? So, well, he says so, he says so, so I, until I got peeled those rubbers off. You know, peeled, you know the story with the motor that puts on the... Kids' boots, you know, <laughs> schlepping the boots on, schlepping the boots on. He goes, boom, finally gets it on. Like, okay, the bus is beeping, and the kid goes, but more quiet, but more quiet, boom. Now, what do you want? They're not my boots. All right. Pulls it off, pulls it off, pulls it off, gets it off. The bus is beeping, gets it off. Now, where are your boots? Now, go, they're my brother's boots. I was just wearing them today, right? Okay. <laughs> So I'm sitting down, and I'm bending over to get my rubbers off, which is not easy when you're my size, you know what I mean? And I finally got the rubbers off, and I started to have an Ishmael and I realized I, I said the words, but I wasn't really into it. So when I walked out, I, you know, someone said to me, who watched the spectacle, he said, you know, maybe they can tell you your wasn't a Shmoneser. But no one can take away the, the, the fact that you worked hard to take your rubbers off. The cover that we do for tefillah, in a way, is stronger than the tefillah itself. So the fact that you stop, and that's really what Tfilah B'Tzibur is. The fact that we finished davening. Okay, you davened. The fact that we're all standing here as a tzibur, and if I would leave, or enough of us would leave, the tzibur falls apart, so I am standing, I'm offering my, my very body, my very essence, as being part, so that gives us a second chance to be able to come in. To be able to come in. So my kid comes over to me, every once they try to play these jokes on their, your father. He goes, Tati, yeah. How do you spell spot? I'm going, oh, I'm so bad at these things. I always fall for it. Okay, how do you spell spot? I'm not going to blow it this time, okay? <laughs> S-P-O-T. But when you pass by a green light, how do you spell what the car has to do? I say, no, 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 that's S-T-O-P, right? He goes, oh, no, by a green light, it doesn't stop. He goes, he got me again. Okay. There's so many times in our life that we stop when we don't want to stop. And we say, what is the Rabbani Shalom doing to us? But in reality, it is an opportunity. It's a second chance to come. So Rabbi Shamshim of Falhersh says an absolutely amazing vart. They were ke'ish echad be'lev echad. And unlike all of the other times that they came to rest, all of the other times that Kalal Yisrael came to rest, they weren't ish echad be'lev echad. It was always with machloikis. 
and tainas or terumas, this isn't good, that isn't good. And the one time that it was Bekidusha, that everybody was Ba'achtus, was when they came to Harsina. So what happened over here? Till now, they always had problems. No food, no water, they don't like the accommodations, I don't like my hotel, give me a different, I don't like this suite, I don't like this, I don't like that. And all of a sudden here, everything is fine and dandy. So what's not going to happen that everything here is fine and dandy? So if Shamsha Falusha says, a dover, a peladic of art. He says, you know, human, everyone has an agenda. So you come the first day in camp, you give out the rooms. I don't want this room, I don't want this counselor, I don't want to be with those kids, I don't want the bunk bed, I don't want the one at the end of the room, I don't want the one at the beginning of the room, I don't want this, I don't want that, you know? Because it doesn't fit my agenda that I want. By Har Sinai, they had an insight. The insight was, here, Tatala, this is the reason you're down here in this world. Okay? You're standing by this side of the mountain around these people. Your purpose on the world is to support these people around you. Your purpose is to take support from these people, to give support to these people. Your purpose down here on this world is to learn from these people, and your purpose is to teach the other people. In order for that to work, you're going to have to go through X amount of situations in life in terms of shiduchim, in terms of business, in terms of shuls, and so on and so on. So by Har Sinai, everyone got their life mission. What happens to the neshama before he comes down to this world, what the Abderov described, how the distribution of money goes, by Har Sinai, everyone had that blitz. That one blitz of lightning, aha. So in Mamela, there were no fights. There were no tainas. Hey, I'm in front of you. Why are you in front of me? Hey, why do I get that? I, I get this apartment. You got that apartment. I don't want the first floor. I want the second floor. Because everyone understood what they had to do. So because by Har Sinai, they had the insight that everybody saw what their purpose is in life, Mamela, there was no machloikas. They hopped right away. We're going to come up to Shemayim after 120 years. It's not going to be that Hashem is going to start explaining to us. Let me explain to you why it took you 3,000 dates to get married. Let me explain to you why you had to wait five years for children. Let me explain to you why you mochi yourself with Panas. So we're going to see, oh, that was my purpose in life. Everything falls into place. Every aspect of our being falls into place. Now, to say, oh, you know, the guy came and he missed the plane and the plane crashed. Ah, oh, now we know whatever Hashem does is good. Uh-huh. So unless 600 people get killed, you don't know whatever Hashem does is good. The, the idea is for us to believe, that's the ultimate in Kabbalah satire. It's for us to believe that in our massive in life, whether we see it or not, what has to happen is who we are. That is standing by Har Sinai. Now some of the people may have felt, well listen, in a Ruchniistic sense, I wish we were on a higher level. And if this is my avoida, this is my job down here in this world, to say good morning to the lady downstairs, to put up with a difficult spouse. This was my avoida, to struggle with my amunah, or whatever my nesiyonis are. Come on, I want a little bit more lofty than that. And that's why there had to be a mitzvah of hagbola. Don't take a step forward. Where you are is the greatest thing in the world. That HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, if you realize your massive, if you realize the troubles in your life and the difficulties you're having in relationships and so on, and the fact that things aren't panning out the way you want, and you understand this is where I am supposed to stand right now by Har Sinai, it doesn't mean you can't hope for it to get better. That is the greatest Yeshua of Iqbalta. Don't go any further. You're only making it worse by going further. So you know that uh, with the school bus strike, so I get to be this school bus driver now. My Astro takes on a new role. Oh. They said, I have to get one of those signs, though, that, you know, that comes out, that says, the red signs that come out, you know, when I stop with flashing lights. I said, I said well, my luck is going to say spot, you know, instead of stop. Uh. <laughs> so this morning, I was asked, please don't forget your phone again. So sometimes I forget my phone at home. So I wake up in the morning, I look around for my phone, I say, I've got to remember, before I walk out, instead of me, instead of me calling from the yeshiva's phone, can let everyone find, who, no, got to find my phone, I listen to my messages. Let, let me find the phone. Let me, somewhere in this dining room, I, I know, I know for a fact, I put it down somewhere in this dining room. And as a matter of fact, I made up, it's going to be in one place, so I know where it is in the morning. Just don't remember where that one place is. So comes the morning, running up, back and forth to the mix, the kids driving in, driving to school, driving to school, get into the van, I totally forgot to look for my phone. I come to Yeshiva, I run upstairs to put on my towels and fill in, I walk into my room, there's the phone on my desk. I go, what a nest that I forgot to look for my phone. Imagine I would have started looking for my phone. I would have had the whole family turning over the whole house, right? I forgot to look for my phone. <laughs> and now I know that I left it here yesterday, you know? Or I left it someplace else and someone brought it back there. The, 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 the mistakes in our life, what we think are missteps, are steps. 
the, the Rebbe of Melech said before he was Nifter that he's, you know, like the famous stories of all the tzaddikim, as soon as he gets up there, he's going to go and tell, he's, he's going to say, I'm not going to Elam Haba until I bring Mashiach. He's up there and uh, Mashiach is not coming. So his son, Rebbe Loza, was very hurt. So he, so he titled himself in the mikveh and in the, in, the, in the rivers there. And he said once, he cried out as he was titling himself, he said, Father, Father, he said, you told me I should remind you, what's with bringing the Mashiach? And he said he had a vision, his father said, he said, you see this ocean? This ocean is from the tears of tzaddikim that are trying to bring Mashiach. He said, but until there is achdus in Klal Yisrael, I cannot help you. There's nothing I can do. Achdus means an understanding that who I am in my life, the difficulties that I have with the people around me, is my tachlis. This is my mission. That doesn't mean I can't try to make my life better. But instead of saying, why me, and why me, and Hashem hates me, and look, no, no, Hashem positioned you in such a way that you can either correct the previous mistakes that you made in previous Golgulim, or that this is part of your original mission. No difference, this is what you have to do. And as we've said many times, that the Gra says the Beis Mikdash has been destroyed because of sinas chinam. What does that mean? What does sinas chinam mean? A sinas chinam. You know, a senseless hatred. No one has senseless hatred. I hate the guy because he takes my parking space. It may not be a good reason to hate him, but most people don't hate someone for no reason. He says the chinam is, if he took your parking place, it was Bashert, you shouldn't have a parking place. It doesn't mean he has a right to take your parking place, but that you believe that he's the one that's causing you the trouble. So somebody once came to the Baal Shem Tov, and uh, he said, take me as a Talmud. He said, then listen to what I'm telling you. He said, you're going to have to go through a kufa in your life where your wife is going to be very upset at you. She's going to accuse you of something, and you're going to be very hurt. And she's going to turn very vicious towards you. Don't blame her. It's part of the Hashgach. Well, I have my friends. They're going to turn on you too. I have my neighbors. They're going to turn on you too. You have to go through this massive now in your life. Well, I have my employers. They're going to turn on you too. My workers, they're going to turn on you too. Even the birds in your town are going to turn on you. Thanks, Rebbe, with a bracha like that, you know. Uh... So he leaves the Baal Shem Tev, and something happened, and his wife was unbelievably angry at him, to the point where she made life very difficult for him at home. Neighbors started talking, friends started talking, he felt terribly isolated. He forgot what the Baal Shem Tev told him, he was so angry at his wife, so angry at the neighbors, so angry at his boss, so angry at everyone that was turning against him, he was so infuriated. To the point where he ran away from home, ran into the woods. And he tried to dive in, and this wild turkey zets him in the head. And he goes, that's it, you know? I'm going to schluck up Paris early this year. And he grabs the turkey, and he says, you too? As he's about to zets it into the tree, he goes, isn't this what the Baal Shem Tov said? That even the birds are going to turn on me. So obviously, just like this bird is not a Baal Bechira, neither are the other. It was Bashar. I had to go through this. I've heard from so many people that in their places of employment and outside, I heard the story three or four times in the last couple of weeks, an outsider came in and began to be right with this person until he lost his job. And he wound up talking some insecure points, but they say, you know, that guy doesn't realize what a favor he did for me, how much better my life is now in this new position that he found and so on. It had nothing to do with that person. He was a shliach. That doesn't excuse us from being, if you look at it, that it's, that everything, then it's no more sin as chinam. That's what's holding back the Beis HaMikdash. It wouldn't be real hate. So just like at that point he realized it's foolish to be angry at the bird, the Baal have told him, so for that matter, how could he be angry at his friends? How could he be angry at his employer? How could he be angry at his wife? And everything in his life started turning the other way around. We don't understand how it works. We just don't do it. The um, Chaim Falagi, the Rav in, uh, in Turkey, Izmir, famous tzaddik, he was old, he was sick, it was a storming day outside, the wind advisory in effect, storms, nasty winds and floods, and he came home, his rabbits and made him a tea, and he sits down to the tea, and says, I'm not at the door. She runs to the door, there's an old lady there, she wants to talk to the Rav, he said, the Rav just came home. Is it an emergency? The lady says no. Can you come back in an hour? Come back in an hour. He's about to drink his tea, he goes, who was by the door? Did I hear knocking? No, it was no one, what was there? So she admits to him there was a lady there. She said it's not an emergency. He gets up, runs out into the freezing cold, walks over to this lady's house, bangs on the door. His mom is shivering away. The wind is almost blowing him away. She goes, Rav, what? I said it's not an emergency. No, my wife had no right to send you away. She, 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 she was very nice. You know? Anyway, he dealt with the issue. He comes back. The tea is cold. And uh, the rabbit says, come on. She said it wasn't an emergency. You have to go running. Your food is cold. 
So he says, doesn't the Gemara say that Rav Shimon and Rabbi Shmuel were one of the Asura, they're from the Asura Ruge Malchus? And they were taken out to be killed. And Rav Shimon and Gamil said, I think it was Rav Shimon and Gamil, oh, what are they, did I do? So Rabbi Shmuel said, maybe somebody once came to you to solve a problem and you were drinking, drinking your cup then, or you were putting on your shoe or putting on your talus, and you said, wait, take it easy, okay, when I'm ready for you. So he, you know, he said, Nicham Tani. So do I know what's going to be? Maybe one day they're going to say, and that lady came knocking on the door and I was drinking my tea, I'd rather have a cold tea. So what does that mean? Is someone Chayiv Misa? Because you tell somebody, excuse me, could you wait a minute? Chas v'shalom. What it means is there are times there's a terrible gzaira, the person has to leave the world. So HaKadosh Baruch Hu brings somebody to your door exactly at the moment that you're drinking your tea. And by you putting down the tea and letting it get cold and go running, everything stops, recalculate. Recalculate. You know, a guy was telling me he was looking for a doctor. And he kept calling, and every doctor's office asks one question. Before you ask them if they have an appointment, what kind of insurance do you have? Which is a nice way of saying you have money, you're going to be treated. If you don't have money, you're not going to be treated. So it's very, very frightening not to have insurance. There may be, it may be one time in your life that your coffee is about to get, you can't wait to sit down to that warm coffee. And someone knocks and someone calls and you look at the caller ID and you want to throw the phone into the bathtub. And instead you say, uh oh, maybe this is it. Hello, hi, is now a good time? Sure. Oh, yeah, I have such a problem. You let me hear. That could be the insurance that you are looking for. Could be the insurance you're looking for. We need these chusim. No, the Chavetz Chaim says a uh, marshal. I think it's Chavetz Chaim's marshal. Guy walks into a bank, stacks a cash, gives it to the teller, gets back a receipt. This guy from the village says, Shogun, all that cash all he gets back is a piece of paper there? It's crazy people, these town people. Another guy walks in with a piece of paper, puts it in, the teller gives huge chunks of cash. That's a smart guy. He says, little does he know, the first guy is a rich guy, he's depositing his day's earnings, another CD, another treasury bond he invested in, and the other guy is now taking out loans after loans after loans. He says, we don't know what's going on in this world. It looks like it's setbacks and you're really buying. In those frustrating moments where you stop to say, this is where HaKadosh Baruch Hu put me in my life, in my marriage, in my children, in my in-laws, let me deal with it, that is the insurance. We're going to come up after Shemayim, they're going to say, ah, it doesn't look good. Mitzvah side, Avera side, you got an insurance policy? This is what we are going to point to. This is an investment in the Mitzvah of our lives. You know, I, I was in Williamsburg, Matzah Shabbos. I had to run out right after this month. There was one, I just forgot my wallet. Never mind, I forgot everything. And I realized afterwards, I'm there, I didn't have a, I finished all my speeches, I didn't have a red cent to my name. It's 12.30 at night, it's after the last bus. I said, okay, where's the local homeless shelter? Uh, no. Sit in the base madrish. It may look good. Three o'clock in the morning, someone's going to come in and say, oh, you always knew he was a mass man. Oh, what? Why are you in Williamsburg? I came to Borough Park, Dafka. The reason I came to Borough Park was uh, because I came to Williamsburg. I didn't want anyone to see what a mass man I am. You know? So anyway, uh, so the nice, I stopped someone and I asked him if he has a number for a car service. He said, yeah. I asked him if he has a phone to call the car service. And I said, look, I have money at home, I hope. And uh, so as I'm sitting in this car, I'm saying, you know, I know I have money at home. Imagine that somebody's alone without money. He doesn't have, doesn't have money at home. Imagine he doesn't have a home. These investments that you make, whether it's for your shalom bayis, whether it's to accept a certain matzah, it doesn't mean you shouldn't dive and it shouldn't get better. That's the cash you're putting away to be with you, to be with you up there. It changes. Kaddish Baruch Hu recalculates the entire Metzias. Everything in your life changes at that moment. So there's a story that this guy in Etsy Israel is driving, which is not an easy feat, and someone comes, a uh, taxi comes flying ahead of him. And you know what I'm going to say now? Israeli taxis, what do they do? Right? They don't drive too fast, they fly too low, and pulls up right in front of him, and they have some kind of a fender bender, which gets very loud. In Hebrew, it's even louder. And uh, this guy comes out, this taxi driver comes out, he is furious, and he opens up the trunk, and he takes out a uh, baseball bat, which is the favorite Israeli pastime, baseball, we all know. And, uh, and, 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 and he's so angry that his new taxi was smashed in that he starts going over and he smashes the guy's windshield. And this guy says, 
This happened to me. I wish I could say it in Hebrew, but he goes just for the flavor of it. But I'm not going to make I don't make comedy skit here. He says this happened to me because my father asked me to drive him someplace today, and I didn't want to. He was one of the smashers when he was ready for the guy to fight. He was ready for like he was getting all geared up. He smashes out his back windows. Two weeks ago, my mother asked me to take her someplace, and I said no. Boom, he lacks out his tires. That must be because I parked in my neighbor's driveway and he couldn't get out. And finally he's like, <laughs> he goes, I am you, what are you nuts or something? What do you keep on trying? Like, we're supposed to have a fight here. He says, you? You can't hurt me. It's my share. i Because whatever has to happen, has to happen. I am Maimon, the Mona Shalem, has nothing to do with you. That's to do with all these things. He puts the bat down and he gives the guy a hug, which happens in Israeli and that's just That's how fights goes. <laughs> and the guy tells him, so what should I say to you? So he says to me, you know what you say to me? Say you're coming to my house for Shabbos. Hmm. Now personally, I don't know if I would want this guy in my house for Shabbos, you know, unless he comes with a bath, you know. But uh, it, 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 there is such a metzius, and our metzius in life, okay, I have to go through this process. Somebody told me that there's a place now uh, out on the island, you come out of the Long Island Railroad, I don't know if this is true or not, and there's a big screen with all sorts of groceries, and you take your phone and you scan on your smartphone or iPhone, you scan on the thing, and by the time you get home, it's delivered to your house. You just scan the picture of that particular item. So I can just imagine what would happen to me. You know what I mean? I'm walking down, with Tati, can I play with the phone? Yeah, sure. Right? And he goes, he's like, ah, click, 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 and I come home, and there's a tractor trailer of diapers, you know, <laughs> in front of my house. There, there are so many things that happen in the course of our lives, we don't understand why is it happening. Who clicked on this? The Rabbani Shalom clicked on it. So they, I, I want to mention something, I think we say it every year, but it's just so powerful, I have to say it again. The Arizal says that Yisrael was in the Shem of Cain. That's why Yisrael is called B'nai Cain. Uh, Moshe Rabbeinu is in the Shem of Hevel. The Arizal says, when the Ravid says on the Rambam, Divrei Hevel Haim, because the Ravid was in the, the Rambam was in the Shem of Moshe, Moshe is Hevel. Okay. I know it's not in Europe, Chaim Alashas, but uh, so Yisrael, how cheshbon here, Rabbi? So Yisrael is Kayin, okay? Uh, Moshe is Hevel. Who is Sepira? So one of the things that Kayin and Hevel argued about was that, Sepira, that uh, Hevel had an extra twin sister. There's one with two twin sisters. Who is the extra twin sister? Sepira, right? Small world. And that's why it says that Yisrael came back. So normally she should be identified as Sepira Bita, says the Bar Maisha from the Urge of Rebbe. Because you identify a person by their closest relative. Why is it Sepira Eshes Maisha? Because this is what's happening over here. Yisroi is now coming back to Maisha Rabbeinu. He's returning. He says, This should have been your wife to start with. I should have never killed you. This was supposed to be your wife. I'm bringing her back. She had to be born to me. I had to raise her in order for me to give her to you, to be Misakin, after I sent her away from you by killing you in your first Gilgal. Okay? Ani Chaisencha Yisroi is Rashi Tevis Achi. I was your brother. Because Cain went around saying, says the Ber Moshe, less din will less dayan, because he was so angry that he was punished, that his carbon wasn't accepted. So what does an angry kid do? Right, Rebbe doesn't care for me, he hates me, he throws me out, right? Less than but less dying. Right? He's picking on me, it's not fear. So what's Yisroi's takana? He has to introduce the parish of Dayonim as a hachana for Kabbalah Satar. One of the things that Cain and Hevel argued about, the Medrash says, is over whose place the Beis Migdash and whose chalik is the Beis Migdash going to stand. So now Yisroi acknowledges, I'm coming, and that's in your Rishos, one of the things that Kayin did, he was a cheapskate, instead of being Makrev Karbonis, what was he Makrev? The, right, the, the things that grew. So now he was Hikrev Oil of Izvach. On top of that, everything here was an ultimate ticket. Now, if you understand what's happening over here, Moshe Rabbeinu could have said, this is, the, this is all the years of Mitzrayim, the 40 years that he was in Midian, the whole he went through with the 10 Makais, his whole life was for this moment of Kabbalah Satira. This was his moment of glory. Moshe, Moshe, yeah, Moshe, what? Your father-in-law is outside of the Ananiya covered. Now he comes? Yeah, he, he shot this arrow through, it came through, and he says he's here. Not now! Tell him to come back, also now he decides to show up. Tell him to come back in a year. Moshe Rabbeinu stops everything and says, if he came now, then Hashem wants him here now. And he comes out to deal with Yisrael. And in reality, this was the ultimate Kabbalah for Kabbalah Satira. Because what did Cloud Yisrael see? Cloud Yisrael also knew this Rizal. 
that he's Yisra, he's kind. They said, whoa, he's killed. He murdered him. He murdered him. What did they say? This lady's trying to get out of jury duty. They say, what's your excuse? Like, said, I'm biased. Why? I was once murdered, she says, you know. <laughs> I mean, my Rabbeinu should say to his father, look, you killed me. Now you want to come? Now? Now my Kabbalah said, wait till I'm ready for you. No, no, no. You come now. The world needs this tikkun right now. You want, and, 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 and the fact that the two should be able to come out in this manner. And, I know I'm your brother, I killed you. But, it's all here. Why does it say, her two sons, not Moshe Rabbeinu's sons? Because the Maestro, she raised them. That was her avoida. You see, that was the Hashgacha. And Vayed say Moshe Likras Choisnoi. He's going to the person that killed me. You're, you're, what that guy did to me, you can't expect me to be Moshe. Yeah, did he kill you? Vayed say Moshe Likras Choisnoi. Vayishtach Vu Vayishagloi. Vayishalu Ish Lerei Eyu Lesholoim. You could have killed me. This was the Hashgacha, the Kain Shekil Hevel. This was the Hashgacha, the world had to go through this matzah. What's the difference? And they're hugging each other. Vayivoyu Ayhella. This is what this is the hachona to Kabbalah Sakaira. Everyone asks the Kasha, how come Moshe Rabbeinu's first son was named Gershon? What does Gershon mean? I was a Ger in a strange land. What was his second son's name? Eliezer, Hashem saved me. First, it should be Hashem saved me from the sword of Parai. And then he was. Uh, so the Rabbeinu Bechai says, says an interesting thing. The minute is that the wife gets the first name. Okay, the wife usually gets the first name. You're not supposed to ask her to give it up. Because then it becomes an issue. That's Al Shalom. So she said, so, so Pirate said, What should I name the first son? Name Eliezer. So I know one thing. I don't know what happened to Moshe. But Hashem sent him into Golis so I should marry him. So I'm thanking Hashem for Gershon. I'm thanking Hashem that he was sent into Golis. Why he went into Golis? What happened? Everyone from their own perspective does what they have to do, right? Soine Batsa. That's why Yisrael said Soine Batsa, because that's what Kayan, that's what threw Kayan out. That's what it's all about. Says the Chavetz Chaim, listen to me, and everyone, and everyone will come, I'll make my bisholem. Now when someone, to a mess, Rachman al-Azlan, you write bisholem. You should go, Yenich al-Mashkovi bisholem. To a live person, you say, which lashon? Lishalem. Says the Chavetz Chaim, no, no, if you go through your life and you do everything right, when you get up there, then you will have shalom. So to wrap things up, Rabbi, say, the Vel says of art, the Mokim She'ein Ish is herring also a fish. A lot of times in our life that, you know, we have to do things. That I don't understand why God wants me to do this. But if it's happening, God wants you to do it. God wants you to do it. And I'm going to be messiahing with this story. That the Baal Shem Tev once went with his Talmidim, and they met a guy running on a horse, and they stopped him. Baal Shem Tev whispered something into his ear. The guy said, okay. Turned around on the horse and ran back. And Baal Shem said, okay, we're going home. And of course the Talmidim said, what was the story? End story. No, no, we can't put this in the storybook. Right? We've got to have a story. So let's just go home. So they went home and ran back to catch this guy. And they said, come on, what did the Hashem tell you? He says, I'm embarrassed. Tell us. We won't tell anybody. Mariah, does anyone know the story, right? So he tells them, you know, a friend of mine is, is like a biggest lamazel in the world. And he made a lot of money. Comes home one day, he has a sack of 10,000 rubble, or whatever it is. And he leaves it on the shelf. Mamish open in front of everybody. So I'm going to teach him a lesson. He should be a responsible person. I take it, I put it in my pocket. Let's see what he does. He's going to walk in, ah, oh, the money! And we have the money. I'm going to say to him, excuse me, I have it. Where did you leave it? Anyway, he puts it in. So the guy comes out, ha, huh, the money! He faints. That's all, that's all. When it's all, there's a whole tumble. He's like, there's not what to do with himself now. The police come and everyone's running and there's a tumble. He's like, uh-oh. You know, he's checking everybody. He like, sneaks out the back door. I'll bring it back tomorrow. Tomorrow, investigations, and he's so sick, and, he, and everyone is tumbling, and the wife is crying, and he goes, Ay, vey. you know, okay, after tomorrow. And after a while, he said, look, it doesn't look like I can give it back right now. May as well invest, you know, may as well invest the money. And then I'll, you know, maybe I'll even have more money for him, and I'll just have to figure out a time that I can give it back to him. He's all said, brach, and then he's sad. Then all of a sudden, the people he owes money to comes, where's the money? I don't have it. You think we believe that story that it was stolen? And they start beating him, and he goes, yeah, 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 yeah. He says, listen, I, you know, I'm going to run away from here. I'm just running away, that's all. <laughs> I got into someone to a rut. I can't do anything with this money. I'm just running. I can't even invest in it. People are going to accuse me. So I took the money, and I got onto the horse, and said, I'm running away. And I meet the Baal He says to me, why are you running away from your problems? I said, you know what I did? I know what you did. You made a mistake. This is what happened. Go over to the guy and says, listen, I got to talk to you, okay? It all started like an innocent prank for a purpose, 
and it just got out of control. Here's the money. Just tell him that. Period. Don't push it off. Don't run away. You have to go through this process with him. He says, I went back and I did it. I thought the guy's going to kill me. And he said to me, boy, this must have been hard for you to do. I really feel bad for you. You have to go through this. And we hugged each other. And we understood this was the process. You know what Parshas Yisrael tells us? Don't run away from your problems. Turn around and face Harsina. And say, this was my mistake. This is what I did. Let's pick it up from here. And that is the true Kabbalah Satayim.